We want to welcome everyone to this Sabbath service today at the Online Christian Church. My name is Henry. I'm standing in for Pastor Lynn Hardy today. Uh, we have our worship at 10 a.m. Mountain Time, and uh, you can check our event calendar page on the online christianchurch.com. Um, we're glad to see you here. We all gathered in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to worship Him in so various formats. Uh, we worshiped Him earlier through the communion, through songs, and now we're going to continue to worship Him by reading His Word and be in awe of Him through what he has done, through what he has uh, accomplished. And um, if you are able to join us through this service, you are able to ask questions. Um, and talking about questions, we will start with one. And But uh, before I go into more detail, I will say that today we will be reading, we will be continuing to read um, about the Lord Jesus' life through the Gospels, and we have been on this journey, diving through uh, the four Gospels, and this uh, one is currently in Matthew chapter 9. So that's what we are going to be reading today, Matthew chapter 9, and we have questions for you. So I would like to ask Gail if you could please read us the first set of questions. Thank you. Why is it crucial to be careful with your thoughts about what you say privately to yourself? A, because Jesus is aware of the words you speak privately to yourself in your mind or in your heart. B, because Jesus knows the thoughts of anyone, whether they follow him or not. C, none of the above because no one can read your thoughts. Or D, A and B. So we got 22 answers. Oh my, and it's an overwhelming D. I think it's uh, the totality. Everybody answered A and B, which is D. So now over to you, Delight, for reading and then finding the answer and uh, what you will read. Thank you, Henry. Welcome. You're welcome. Matthew chapter 9, verse 1. And Jesus, getting into a boat, crossed to the other side and came to his own town, Capernaum, too. And behold, they brought to him a man paralyzed and prostrated by illness, lying on a sleeping pad. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven and the penalty remitted. Three. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, this man blasphemes. He claims the rights and prerogatives of God. Four, but Jesus, knowing, seeing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil and harbor malice in your heart? Verse five, for it's easier to say, Your sins are forgiven and the penalty remitted, or to say, Get up and walk. Six, but in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins and remit the penalty, he then said to the paralyzed man, get up, pick up your sleeping pad and go to your own house. Seven. And he got up and went away to his own house. Eight. When the crowd saw it, they were struck with fear and awe. And they recognized God and praised and thanked him who had given such power and authority to men. Nine, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man, Matthew, sitting at the tax collector's office. And he said to him, be my disciple, side with my party and follow me. And he arose and followed him. 10, and as Jesus reclined at table in house, Behold, many tax collectors and especially wicked sinners came and sat, reclined with him and his disciples. 11. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your master eat with tax collectors and those preeminently sinful? 12. But when Jesus heard this, he replied, Those who are strong and well, healthy, have no need of a physician. But those who are weak and sick, 13, go and learn what this means. 
I desire mercy, that is readiness to help those in trouble and not sacrifice and sacrificial victims. For I came not to call and invite to repentance the righteous, those who are upright and in right standing with God, but sinners, the erring ones, and all those not free from sin. Excellent. Thank you, the light. So did you see the answer in the uh, verses that you read? Yes, I go with the multitude <laughs> that say this D. <laughs> So it's A and A and um, B, yes. which is D. Yes. Could you explain to us uh, uh, how so? Which is yes, it is the correct answer. But could mm -hmm. you explain further? In verse four, it, it specifically says there, and Jesus, knowing and even seeing their thoughts, said, "You know." So he saw their thoughts. He knew what was in their hearts. Um, that's verse four. That is. Cool. And um. Okay, yes, that's where it particularly it, it um, was very obvious that Jesus saw their hearts, he knew their hearts, what they were thinking in verse 4. Excellent, thank you. Yes, absolutely, that is correct. That's the verse that gives the, the answer because the Lord, being God, he is able to see the thoughts, to read the thought, to have an awareness of the thought to an extent that we don't understand because the person is keeping it inside so it's not coming it, we are not perceiving it with ears or with our eyes uh, but the lord being who he is he's able to hear and to see the thoughts so wonderful so the light do you have any insight as you were reading this passage and that you could share with us that the holy spirit had put on your heart to share with us yes actually um this set of scriptures really blessed me, especially the fact that Jesus was in his own town. The very first verse, verse one, talked about Jesus crossing to the other side and coming into his own town. Um, we've seen in other scriptures where he was not received in his own town, so he could not do a lot of miracles. But here, at this particular time, when he went to his own town in Capernaum, he did these two miracles, and yet the reaction of the people was um, like we see this first one with the man, the paralyzed man, and even seeing the faith of the man. So it wasn't only the thoughts of the evil thoughts of the Pharisees that Jesus saw. He also saw the faith of the man. You know, the man didn't even have to say anything. The man didn't have to really do anything. His faith alone, Jesus saw it and knew that, yes, this, this man is ready to receive from me. So when Jesus saw um, their faith, his, the, the faith of the man and the faith of the friends that brought him, something happened. You know, so that's why when we ask people to come into agreement with us, to have faith with us as we pray, over something. So our faith and other people's faith coming together brings answer and Jesus sees it. So I just want to emphasize that point of Jesus knowing their heart. He sees the heart when we have faith and we are truly believing and trusting him. He sees our hearts and the thoughts that go in our hearts, whether it's evil, whether it's right, and, um, and all that goes on in our hearts. And this just takes me back to Wednesday here. We were looking at Proverbs chapter 21, <laughs> incidentally. And verse 2 of Proverbs 21 says, Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs and examines the hearts of people and their motives. You see, he weighs our hearts, he sees our hearts, he, he, he sees even the motives. And we, we saw another time in Jeremiah, where the Bible says the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? When it comes to the heart, it really takes the Lord to reflect our heart to us, to mirror back our heart to us, because sometimes we don't even know our hearts. We, the owners of the heart, we may not fully um, see the motives, the underlining motives behind some of the things that we are asking from the Lord or even doing our actions. But when the Holy Spirit reveals it, 
and exposes it, then we are able to see where we are erring and receive forgiveness as we confess and repent. And I also saw that the Pharisees, they were um, attacking Jesus' authority. And for me, this was like a prayer point and something to look into to say, the spiritual authority that we have over us, do we attack that authority? Do we question a lot of things? Because these people didn't understand what Jesus was doing. They haven't really seen anything like this. It was different. They, they had not seen any prophet or rabbi that did things that Jesus was doing, was, was, Jesus, was doing um, at this time. So there was a lot of questions in their heart. And, you know, sometimes when there's leadership over us and God is speaking to that leader and, and saying some things that is deep that we may not have heard before, we may not have um, seen it before, it's, it's new. There's this inclination to question. But instead of attacking, we need to ask the Holy Spirit. And that is what these the Pharisees didn't do. They didn't really find out from God. This is such a different teaching. This is a different way. Lord, is this from you? But they were attacking Jesus, even in their hearts. And some cornered the disciples to even say, your master is doing this. He's eating with sinners. It's, you know, there was no direct asking to say, we don't understand what you are doing. Can you explain to us? So, in, um, what I'm saying is I just see how that we must be careful in attacking authority when something has been shared that we don't understand. We need to take it back to God. The Bible talks about the Christians in, in Berea that they, they when they heard Paul speak, they had to always check back if it aligned with the word of God. They were they were studious. They were they were. Um, efficient in, in, in reconciling what they were hearing with the word of God. And that is the right way to do instead of attacking leadership or attacking authority is to go back to God to find out if that is true. So that is what I got from this portion of the scriptures. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Delight. There's a nice uh, insight in the word uh, with regard specifically not to attacking authority. Yes, it is the Lord's way that we are not to attack authorities because all authorities have been pin, put in place uh, one way or shape or another by the Lord who is the authority, the supreme authority. So he has delegated his authority down to a certain level and uh, it is fitting not to attack authorities. Uh, they are ordained by him and it is fitting to be respectful of that. Yes, sometimes authorities can do things that we do not align with our values. But in you know, Romans 13, we read about that and it is fitting to, uh, to, be, uh, to, be, uh, to go by what is proper and fitting in the sight of the Lord. Um, and also in this, as you were talking, uh, Delight, I could see the, you, you mentioned the faith of, uh, of this person who went to the Lord and uh, and it is, it is good to see that the Lord can see our faith level. He can see our thoughts. He can hear our thoughts. But also He can see our faith. And that is good because then He knows where we are in our journey. And He knows what type of help we need to be able to grow through, uh, through our journey. To be, to be able to decipher uh, how, what type of help we need. Uh, to increase our faith, to increase our conviction in Him. Wh where are the areas where we are? We need more help, and He knows that, and He's able to help us. So it is fitting to go to Him in prayer and ask the Lord to help us grow in our faith, increase our faith, increase in in, in the in the knowledge of Him. So, uh, so that's what, also what I was receiving when you were explaining. So thank you, Delight, for your explanation. I'd like to ask if there is any elder who have uh, any point to contribute with regards to these uh, first 13 verses that we've read today. I like how Delight brought out not to attack leaders. Um, 
we have seen different leaders within ministry do different things. And I can only speak for myself that previously I believed everything that was spoken to me. And I, but I didn't test the spirit by the spirit. I did not go to God. But we know now that in all things, we are to seek the Lord because God does give leaders some awesome, oh my gosh, revelation. And when he does that, he all, it all, when you study the word and go over the scriptures that are given to you, um, churches I was in before, it wasn't given scriptures, um, which is what I appreciate about the online Christian church. We're given scriptures to back everything that is stated. So it's easy to go back and look, but I can just speak for myself um, that previously, to be honest, I didn't. So when I think about that, that's a place of repentance. Um, asking the Lord to forgive me for not studying the things that was being taught to me from um, at that time, the pulpit. So um, it's in the online Christian church, everything that's stated, we have scriptures to go back. And the word teaches us to study to show ourselves approved unto God and not unto man. So it's like when we receive something, and even in the course of the learning, scriptures are there for you to be able to witness what the Lord is saying through leadership, to witness what the Lord is, you know, um, trying to bring us out of, um, whether it's deliverance, whether it's healing, everything is available to receive God's truth. So um, I just wanted to add that and thank you for sharing that. Um, delight. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Oh yes, very good point. Yes, not to attack leaders, because the Lord had put them as leaders for a reason. He has guided them on a path and had given them the grace to receive some knowledge, uh, to be able to share with the, with, with, with the team, with the, the group that are put under their leadership. So it is fitting to not attack them and, uh, and, uh, and to respect the Lord by not attacking them as well because we don't know what journey people are on and uh, how they got to where they are and how the Lord has been leading them and what the Lord has, has still in uh, in store for them. So uh, uh, so it is better to be prudent and cautious and uh, take everything, like you said, Cynthia, take it to the Lord in prayer and uh, and seek the Lord's will, the Lord's uh, seek the Lord's face in uh, in the midst of uh, any situation. So. Uh, I, I, I fully and fully agree. So, Denise, I can see you're unmuted. Go right ahead, please. I, I agree, too. But also, if a leader is off, and if you take it to the Lord and pray about it, the Lord will correct the leader. I see that um, in my own life, you know, when the churches I was in, and if the leader was off, you know, we would pray about it and not um, actually attack a leader. And then God would um, get them back on, on point. So I wanted to add that as well. Excellent point. Yes, yes. By, uh, by the Lord's amazing abilities, when you take the things things to, pray, to him in prayer, he's able to address them. And he's able to address them as he sees fit. So it is, uh, it is a safe bet to, uh, to pray about it instead of uh, taking matters in our own hands. So thank you. Thank you, Denise. All right. That's wonderful. Delight. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to highlight again verse 2 as the Holy Spirit is just pointing it out to me. Um, when Jesus, it says, And behold, they brought to him a man paralyzed and prostrated by illness, lying on a sleeping pad. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, take courage, son, your sins are forgiven and the penalty remitted. Jesus didn't start by just commanding him to rise up and walk. He had to forgive the sins, which was like going into the root of the issue to handle it, forgiving him his sins and um, the penalty. It's like we would say today, whatever um, charges were laid against him, you know, he, he removed them. And 
I'm just so grateful to the Lord for the, this truth that he has also brought to us through this ministry, that we can go and confess our sins, repent of them, and so that the root of whatever issues we are going through will be sorted out. And look at what he said to the man. He says, take courage. In other words, if, even when we don't see the physical healing or the physical manifestation of whatever it is we desire um, breakthrough, the fact that the root has been handled, the sin has been forgiven, that courage to know that things are going to turn in the physical, it will change. And that was exactly what the Pharisees were questioning, like, who give, gave him the right to forgive this man his sin? I think they were just expecting him to go and command him to be healed and, and raise him up and make him to walk. But Jesus, knowing the source, the issues, and, and like I said, I thank God for our ministry, our church, that the Lord is opening up this truth to us, that we can pray for people, have intercession for people, and go to the root asking the Holy Spirit where exactly he wants to, and um, which area he wants to, to address. And he himself brings up that area and, and handles it the way he wants, the way he deems fit, the right way that will bring a lasting solution. The Holy Spirit was just highlighting to me in this same verse to say, if Jesus had maybe healed this man without the issue of the sin being taken care of, he would have still been healed. He would have walked. But who knows, a few months down the line, few years down the line, he'll be back to, 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 to the bed where he, where he, to square once, so to speak. So, yeah, it just um, brought me joy to say thank you, Lord, for also giving us this knowledge, this revelation as to going to the roots, handling the sin aspect before um, any other thing. Thank you. Thank you, Delight. This is an excellent point and I couldn't agree more that the aspect of the sin needs to be it needed to be addressed as a, as a crucial element of the healing for this person. Um, and the Lord highlighted that in verse 2, as you said, by forgiving the sin of this person. And that is why the, uh, uh, the authorities, um, the, the, the scribes, were so outraged because they were saying that, well, this person is talking uh, with the prerogative of God because God is the only one who can forgive sins. And, uh, but they, they failed to recognize that Jesus on earth, walking as the Son of Man, had the authority and the power to forgive sin. And that's what he did. And he addressed the sin before turning to the man and saying to the man, you know what, now uh, get up and walk, you are healed. Right? So uh, we could see also how the Lord uh, operates uh, similarly in, uh, in our ministry by uh, helping people identify areas that have brought uh, illness or sickness in their life, any type of sin or any type of wrong agreement that uh, they have come into which has enabled the enemy to have a case against them and bring in uh, havoc and things like that. And by identifying that first, addressing it, confessing, repenting, and receiving forgiveness. And then the Lord moves in and provides the healing. So we've seen that, that, that the Lord has operated like that also and so many times through His wonderful tender mercies. So thank you, thank you, Delight, for having uh, highlighted this. It is uh, quite significant to recognize uh, this way that the word that the Lord works as well. So we will go to the second set of questions, and I understand that uh, we might uh, go through something similar. So get over to you for the second set of questions, please. For the second section, uh, what statement below is correct or what statements below are correct? A, we should not fast as a ritual, but we should let the Holy Spirit lead us in this area. B, as we desire to be flexible for the Lord, even during a fast, the Holy Spirit can help expand our knowledge and reach in the same manner a new wine causes a new wine skin to stretch. C, all of the above. Or D, none of the above. So thank you also, 
everyone for having provided your answers i could see a lot of people answered c so a lot of people answered all of the above so we'll see if uh, uh, that is the correct answer so i'm going to ask gail if you could please read the next section from matthew 9 14 to 26. matthew 9 verse 14 then the disciples of John came to Jesus inquiring, Why is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, that is, abstain from food and drink as a religious exercise, but your disciples do not fast? 15. And Jesus replied to them, Can the wedding guests mourn while the bridegroom is still with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. 16. No one puts a piece of cloth that has not been shrunk on an old garment, for such a patch tears away from the garment, and a worse rent or tear is made. Verse 17. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins, for if it is, the wines burst and are torn in pieces, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are ruined. But a new wine is put into fresh wine skins, so that both are preserved. 18. And while he was talking this way to them, behold, a ruler entered and kneeling down, worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just now died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will come to life. 19. Jesus got up and accompanied him with his disciples. And just then, as a woman who had been to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. 21. And she said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. 22. Jesus turned around, seeing her, said, Take courage, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And at once the woman was restored to health. 23. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making an uproar and din, 24, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed and jeered at him. 25. But when the crowd was ordered to go outside, he went in, took her by the hand, and the girl arose. 26 and the news about this spread all through that district thank you gail for having read this and did you see the answer in that passage i'm gonna go with what everybody else said so um a we should not fast as a ritual but should let the holy spirit lead us in this area and b as we desire to be flexible for the Lord, even during a fast, the Holy Spirit can help us expand our knowledge and reach the same manner as a new wine causes a new wine skin to stretch. So, see. Thank you. Excellent. That is the answer. And may you explain to us why these two combine <laughs> uh, correct as the answer for this question? So, they first, so it was interesting because on the uh, verse 14, when John's disciples came to him. I had to look that up as to why that was. And the Pharisees and John's disciples would fast every Monday and Thursday. This was a ritual. It became a ritual for fasting, which I did not know till today. <laughs> okay. But it became a ritual. And then so Jesus said in verse 15, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn when he's with him? And then in 16, we see about the patching of the, un he goes in and explains about the um, uh, wine skin and, uh, and the patch. So from verses 14 through 17, we see our answer. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, they do. Uh, they, they used to do this uh, ritual as uh, this fasting ritual because of uh, uh, that there was a religious practice. There was a, a practice that uh, they, they got accustomed to and then... Uh, it was like okay well this is the day we fast and then we'll do this check it off the list and then next to, to the next day and so on and so forth so it became so much a ritual uh, a, re a religious ritual and uh but then the jesus's answer was so revealing he was revealing to the extent that uh, that brings them the understanding that they need to be like those new wine skin flexible ready to be uh, ready to be expanded by the working of the wine that is fermenting and the wine that is inside taking expansion taking more and more space and 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 uh, and, and and obliging or, or obligating the skin to expand as the wine is expanding and that is uh, that is a uh, a way of the working of the Holy Spirit in us. We are called to expand with Him. 
we are called to go into into ways that the Holy Spirit wants to lead us so that uh, we can follow his lead uh, as many as are led by the Spirit of God the word says so being led by the Spirit is to go in the areas that he's leading us into not to follow rigid and regimented rituals that has to be done this way otherwise somebody is in trouble no it needs to be it needs to be we need to have this flexibility to follow his lead and and to ask questions and and be curious about what the holy spirit is doing so we can understand more and 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 then we can follow him willingly with a heart that desires to be to be uh, led, desires to be trained, desires to know more about this wonderful Father who we, who we have. So uh, I love that analogy of the new one skin that the, that the Lord Jesus mentioned, uh, because the Holy Spirit is inside of us and He's working. It's like the new one is inside of the one skin and it is working and it's expanding. And the contrary, well, we can see that the Lord is also uh, very much uh, cautious about that in a sense that He doesn't want He doesn't want the wine skin to break or the wine to be spilled, and that's why He say, well, uh, if you put a new wine in an old wine skin, then the new wine will ferment, but at some point, the wine skin will break, and uh, the wine will be spilled and so everything will get ruined so the the, the wine skin and the wine will get ruined whereas you need to adjust and and make sure that the wine the new wine is put in a new wine skin so that all work together and uh, and that expansion happens so it is uh, wonderful to see uh, that uh, the lord has uh, made made this uh, this uh, um, imagery I brought this imagery to talk about the flexibility we are to adopt when it comes to uh, to fasting I would like to ask if there is any elder that has any comments but I'll uh, go to Gail first Gail uh, since you read this question uh, this passage may you uh, expand on anything that the Lord has brought to you uh, with us thank you well, you know I've read this so many times and we all have and it's easy to skim over it but when Delight was in reading, and you were talking earlier about where your heart is. And it really resonated with me this time because I was thinking about that. And first, you know, you have the wineskins and people asking, and it's so easy for any kind of what we think of as religious or any kind of habit we have, like we sing or we pray, how we do it. It can become very easily become, um, it can become a ritual and not actually something from our heart. And that really hit me as you were saying earlier. But the other thing that really struck me is we have um, we have this um, leader who came up and said, my daughter died. <clears throat> we had that centurion, I think it was in, it may have been chapter eight or chapter seven, where we had a centurion who just said, you don't have to come. You just, you say the words and it happens. Yet this elder or this, this person has had him come with them. And then you have the faith of this woman who she just wanted to touch his hem of his garment and be healed. And it truly is where the heart is. And we all are in a different place. And you may not be able to be just as the woman where you can just touch it and know that it's going to happen. You may not be as a centurion and say, you know, that um, just say the words and it'll happen. You may be where the leader is where you have to come. But either way, the Lord knows that, and the Lord hears what's in our heart. And, and that's what really came about this for me today. That's excellent. Thank you, Gail, for sharing this. Yes, we are all on a different, uh, a different place when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. We love Him. We want to know Him more. And uh, yet, uh, we could be at the place of that woman uh, where she knows without any doubt that if this is to happen, for sure she will be healed. Where the centurion, yes, Lord, you just say a word and I'm good with that. It's going to happen for sure. And that is his faith as well. But as the other one, yes, the, the other passed away. But if you come, I know she will come back. And and that's that's the different places where they are. And I'm glad that you brought this forward, Gail, because it is, a, it is so profoundly linked to the faith that we have. 
with him to and that faith is based on some type of understanding and which leads us to know what we know and uh, and because we know that we know that the Lord is able uh, as we do something as we go to him he will help he is able and he is able to give knowledge and understanding and healing and so on so uh, thank you Gail for having uh, brought this forward yes the light go ahead I just want to emphasize the very first verse on this second side where we're reading verse 14 where the Bible says the disciples of John came to Jesus um, I had said earlier on how the Pharisees, instead of going to Jesus directly to ask him some things, were going through the disciples and accusing Jesus, your master eats with um, the sinners and all of that. But you could see the difference. The disciples of John, on the other hand, came to Jesus and inquired of him. They had questions in their heart and they went to Jesus and asked, OK, we've noticed that we and the disciples of of the Pharisees, they used to fast. Why is it that your disciples are not fasting? And I think that is the attitude we need to have with leaders too, that when some things are not clear with us, we can go straight to them, send an email in our day and age, um, call them and ask, ask that question that is bothering you, than making it a topic of gossip, you know, going through somebody else and asking other people and all of that. And I'm also blessed with what Gil shared that yes, we are all at different levels indeed. But I see here um, how Jesus was really led of God. The, the, the ruler that came to him in another, in another part of the gospels, it's, it gave the age of the child. The child was 12 years old. And yet you find a woman also who had suffered from this flow of blood for 12 years. So there's this thing about the number 12 that is just going around here and uh, and we know the number 12 i think is is that of um um rulership or what um correct me there you know he had 12 disciples and there were 12 tribes of of israel but you can see how there was this anointing to to deal with this thing and the woman also we're talking about the heart the bible said she kept saying to herself that is where her own faith was. Today, we would say she she um, strengthened her spirit and her spirit was strong. She kept saying to herself, we talk about reading the word out loud to strengthen our spirit, you know, declaring it over yourself. So this was in, in, in her own time, what she knew, but she kept saying to herself, building up her faith, strengthening her spirit to say, if I just get to do this, get close enough, I know I will be healed. So that's good. Excellent point. Thank you, Delight, for having shared. Yes, uh, we could see uh, a few correlations there. Um, the number 12 was uh, particularly got highlighted for me because I was born on a, on a 12. And uh, when, uh, when I see things like that in the word, uh, it jumps out to me. and. Uh, and yes, 12 has has to do with the government rulership, like you mentioned, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples, and uh, the 12, uh, um, 12 gates uh, of the new Jerusalem to, uh, to indicate how the Lord rules and, and governs uh, things. And, uh, and we can see those correlations. And at the age of 12, that's the way, where accountability is imputed on to the person as well. And uh, so we can see all these uh, many correlations in the word. And, and in all that, the Lord is able to, to operate in miraculous ways, meeting people where they are on their journey of faith and coming and helping them, uh, using the power that the Father has given him to, to meet with the people, to meet with their need, to help them. To provide assistance to them so uh so glory to god for what the lord jesus has done and uh, that we are reading and knowing more and more about him today all right is there any other comment from the elders i would like to ask gail could you please read us question number three what attitude did the lord jesus adopt when he saw the multitude scattered like sheep without a shepherd a he was moved with compassion b he was moved by justice, or C, he was moved by judgment. 
and we have the answers that are in 33 out of 33 answered a 100% on uh, on a no, nothing on b nothing on c either so we now need to read the section from Matthew 27 to 38 and then find out whether it is the correct answer and I would like to ask Denise if you could please read this next section for us thank you Matthew 9 27 as Jesus passed on from there two blind men followed him shouting loudly have pity and mercy on us son of David 28 when he reached the house and went in the blind men came to him and Jesus said to them do you believe that I'm able to do this they said to him yes Lord 29 then he touched their eyes saying according to your faith and trust and reliance on the power invested in me be it done to you 30 and their eyes were opened and Jesus earnestly and sternly charged them, see that you let no one know about this. 31, but they went off and blazed and spread his fame abroad throughout the whole district. 32, and while they were going away, behold, a dumb man under the power of a demon was brought to Jesus. 33, and when the demon was driven out, the dumb man spoke. And the crowds were stunned with bewildered wonder, saying, Never before has anything like this been seen in Israel. 34. But the Pharisees said, He drives out demons through and with the help of the prince of demons. 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, and curing all kinds of disease and every weakness and infirmity. 36, when he saw the throngs, he was moved with, with pity and sympathy for them because they were bewildered, harassed and distressed and de dejected and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. 37, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is indeed plentiful, but the laborers are few. And 38, so pray to the Lord of the harvest to force out and thrust laborers into his harvest. Thank you, Denise, for having read this. And did you see the answer in uh, the section that you read? Yes, it was A was the answer. He was moved with compassion. That was A. The attitude that the Lord Jesus had when he seen the uh, crowd scattered. Indeed, the answer is uh, A. He was moved with compassion and pity for the people. So is there any insight that you would like to uh, share with us as you read this passage? Um, there was a, I noticed that whenever he healed the uh, blind man, the blind man after he... Um, who raised the woman from uh, the child from the dead and all that, that the blind men um, came to him and asked him to have pity. And he asked them about their faith. And they said that they had the faith to believe. But uh, it's also shown that once they were healed, you know, he touched them. And, and there's different ways that Jesus heals us as well. You know, some touch, the other ones he put um, spit in mud <laughs> and put it on someone's eyes. Um, but and then sometimes he told people to get up and walk. But um, I noticed that the blind man went out and got the other guy who was um, dumb and possessed with a demon. It said he brought they he brought a mute and dumb um, um, demon possessed man to Jesus. And I thought that um, that that would show their faith how how their faith increased for them to go out and get somebody else and bring them to Jesus. Um, and then also. I noticed too that when Jesus is moved to compassion, that there is always a uh, it, it stirs Jesus to action, and and later on when you see in Luke when that happens, you'll see that uh, that he 
commissions more people to go into the harvest. Because he said the, the harvest was great, but the laborers are few. And so it he it's like he, he he was stirred to action with that compassion. So he also commissioned 70 more people, excuse me, to go out into the harvest. And like I said, the Bible doesn't tell all the miracles that G Jesus did because it just gives us a snippet because it said that um later on in scripture that if they're if they put down every miracle that Jesus did, there would be no books that can contain it in this world. So that's my take on it. Thank you. Thank you for having shared this with us, Denise. Indeed, uh, he did. The Lord Jesus did so many miracles that uh, it would have been, uh, oh, quite a quite a sight to see the books, the number of books to be written about all of them. Um, and as you were talking, I um, I uh, I also uh, agree with the diversity of the way that the Lord Jesus heals the people. He has even just in this chapter, we've seen how diverse he went about healing, and uh, and, and how how he was uh, he was particular in in each case. In, in the case, he was get up and walk, and another it is uh, he touched the eyes. So he, there was this physical contact. And in another one, it was a question. And in another one, it was an encouragement. Be of good cheer. Your faith has made you whole. You could see that his diversity. He's, he doesn't go by ritual. Like, okay, this is how we have to do every time and every single time. No, he's, uh, the Lord is uh, able to do in so many different ways. We can see the work of his, hand, of his hands. We can see even the trees, how diverse the trees are. And, and, uh, and when the snow falls, how the, uh, the 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 snowflakes are so unique, yet they look they look the same. And how trees, plants, and fish, and and human being, eight billions of us on this planet, and we all different, some way, shape, or another. So uh, the Lord is very diverse in how He operates. So it is proper, it is fitting, not to limit Him by oh this is how He is to operate, and this is the only way. That he has to do so it is to to humble ourselves before him and to uh, let him operate the way he would like to operate in our lives and all around us as well so um that is fitting um denise do you well, another thing too is that he always meets us at our need you know he knows what each and every one of us needs and how he and that's why he does things the way he does it because of our um what we need and I thought that was awesome. That is great. Yes, that is awesome as well. It's not a one size fits all. It he he really adjusts himself to 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 come and meet us where we are, and uh, and that is wonderful of him. So thank you for sharing this, Cynthia. So that you're muted, uh, will you share? Um. Yes, Henry. <laughs> the part um for me was when it says that. In verse 33, it says, never before has anything like this been seen in Israel. And I think about, you know, it talks about all the miracles that he did, right? And everything hasn't been written, but it's like when we see God move and we know it's God, why don't we continue the faith to believe that if he did it once, he'll do it in our lives again. If he shifted us in a position he want, why why don't we hold on to the faith of what he did before? I always look back and be like, okay, God did this. Why wouldn't he do this? Why am I not trusting him to continue in the healing or continue in the deliverance? You know, it's like we we have to have that, that faith to believe no matter what. If God said it, he going to do it. He going to fulfill it. It's like, you know, man will say, okay, well, you know, an example, I'm going to pay you on Friday and and something happens and they don't pay you, you know, but if God says he's going to do it, I mean, it's done. It's like, we need to rely on that. But it, that kept coming back to me. Never before has anything like this been seen in Israel. There's things that, you know, I go outside, like someone was sharing the grass is green and you know, it's going to be green because God, God created it to be green. You know, the sky is going to be blue and it's going to be beautiful. And it's like, Having that faith to believe mm -hmm. and knowing who God is back to that relationship, knowing, you know, all the healings and things he did, you know, casting out the demons, mm -hmm. 
you know, he cast them all, not one, two, he cast them all out, but it's also having to not only our faith lining up with God's faith, but also whoever is going through that deliverance, believing that God is, believing that you're ready to receive deliverance and you're saying, Lord, I want to be delivered. But well, if you don't get it today, it's okay. Like Delight was saying, you know, when um, always asking the Holy Spirit, is there something else? Is there something else? But when you coming in for healing and deliverance, believing, yes, I'm going to be free, you know, not put no doubt. And I mm -hmm. know it takes time. It's a process, but it's like, yes, God's going to do this for me. So that, that, that's where I was. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Yes, believing is very much important. We've seen the example through the, 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 the chapter today that they believed. And even Jesus specifically asked the two blind men, do you believe that I can do this? They say, yes, yes, we believe. <laughs> we see that believing, trusting and relying on Jesus is absolutely fundamental. And like you said, uh, Cynthia, when somebody said that they're going to do this, uh, maybe not, maybe they will, maybe they won't. But the Lord Jesus, when he said he will do it, he will do it because he's God. I mean, his name is the truth. It's not that he says the truth on, from time to time. He is the truth, period. <laughs> so when he said that he's going to do it, we just need to believe. We bring our faith to meet with his divinity, his glorious personality, uh, who he is. And, uh, and, and, and that stirs up our faith and it strengthens us uh, by the fact that we are not relying on us but we are relying on him, on his ability, on his power, and on his compassionate love that he has for us. So we need to keep that in mind, knowing that he cares deeply about us to be able to help us, to be able to meet us where we are, and uh, to lead us on a, on a perfect and great way. So uh, as you were talking, he, uh, Mark uh, 9, 23, when it's, you know, even if we, um, it says, and Jesus said, you say to me, if you can do anything, why all things can be, po are possible to him who believes. And this was where, you know, it says, Lord, I, if I help my unbelief, help me to believe what you're saying to me, help me to walk in the things, um, you know, that you're giving me to do, help me to believe in my deliverance. So that, yeah, Mark, 23 25 i just paraphrase a little bit but it's like help my unbelief help me to walk you know to believe that deliverance is mine to believe that healing is mine you know because god witnessed to us collectively as well as separately and if the lord has said he's going to do something for you then he's going to do it it says at once the father of the boy gave an eager piercing cry with tears and said lord i believe help my weakness of faith. Um, verse 25, but when Jesus noticed that a crowd of people came running um, together, he rebuked the unclean spirit saying to it, you dumb and deaf spirit, I charge you to come out of him and never go into him again. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for letting me share that. That was Mark 23, 25. Yes. Oh, thank you for having shared it. This is a uh... This is a great working of the of how we are to work with our faith when we are in the presence of the Lord when we pray. It is it is key because in this section that you shared with us, Cynthia, we can see that the Father recognized his his lack of faith. He's uh, uh, that the, he's struggling with his faith, and then he cried out, and the Lord met with him, met with him where he was. And uh, even charged the spirit never to go back anymore. So we could see that, yes, faith can be put into action by how we express our heart towards the Lord and uh, how we come and meet with Him and, and just be so frank by opening our heart to Him. Uh, so thank you for having shared this, Cynthia. It's, uh, it's very much fitting in this. The light, go right ahead. Over to you. Thank you. I also just want to add to what everyone is saying concerning faith 
um, this scripture that talks about walk your walk your own salvation with with fear and trembling, that it takes a knowledge of the word to strengthen our faith or build our faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. The woman with the issue of blood kept saying to herself, like I said previously, like, you know, we can, we can say she strengthened her spirit. And even these blind men, the Bible said they came shouting, have pity and mercy on us, son of David. So they had a knowledge that this must be the son of David. They had seen, it's, it's written that it's only the Messiah. The Messiah would come from the line or lineage of David. It's only the Messiah that will be able to heal the deaf and mute, you know, all those things that had been written about the Messiah. I believe they had followed Jesus. They had seen all he has, all he's been doing. And they were sure that this is the Messiah, the son of David. So when they came asking for healing from Jesus, they said it outright with confidence, with assurance, have mercy on us, son of David. And Jesus also trying to make sure, are you calling me the son of David because you heard other people saying it? Or, you know, do you believe? And he asked them again and they confirmed, yes, yes, yes. So I see the knowledge there. You know, in our time, we say they had a knowledge of the word. Yes, they didn't have the Bible then, but the Torah that they had, they, they could see the effect of it or, or Jesus exhibiting those things that have been written. So as we study the word, as we take time to interact with the word, gain knowledge from the word, and through the help of the Holy Spirit, that will increase our faith and bring that assurance that we can say without a shadow of a doubt, yes, I know you can do it. Yes, you are my healer. Yes, you are my deliverer. Yes, you are my provider. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Indeed, faith just first is stirred up through the knowledge that we have of our Lord. And, uh, and we could see that all these people who were, uh, uh, who were healed of their, of their illnesses, I mean, with the exception of the, the, the mute and, and dumb man at that time, all of them exercised the knowledge that they had. They, uh, they, they, they exercised that knowledge because they, they knew something and then they put it into action. Just like uh, one of the elders mentioned earlier that uh, uh, Jesus was moved by compassion. So he had compassion and he did something about it. And that, that is so critical because that knowledge and that movement of the heart needs to be followed by an action. And I could see that I, even, even as I, I'm sharing now, uh, the Lord is helping me understand that the dumb man had something that the, the, um, the blind man did not have. He could see. So as he could see that these two previously were blind, um, and now that they are healed, even though he cannot express himself, he cannot hear, but by seeing the, uh, uh, the two blind men, the two previous blind men coming to him and bringing him to the Lord, now he has knowledge to walk and follow them so that he can receive his knowledge too. So I, as I was explaining right now, I was receiving that. Yes, that's the way he also exercised his knowledge. So he knew something, that something was different. He, he could see them before that they were blind. And now they are no longer blind. And he could see that they are dragging him. They are pulling him towards this healer, this person, this the son of man, the son of God. The, the 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 son of David, Jesus the Messiah. So he followed them, knowing that something good is going to happen, and it happened to them to him as well. So we could see that throughout all these passages, uh, everyone uh, got healed because they exercised their knowledge. They knew something about Jesus, and they acted upon it, and they, they their situation improved. So glory to God for uh, all that we've read here today, and uh, and that we've uh, and I pray that this has uh, really uh, stirred up our faith in Him and uh, has helped us to uh, uh, to trust and rely on the Lord Jesus even more. Glory to God. I know that there was a question before, so Jason, may you bring that question forward today? All right, so the question I have is, uh, the man was, um, this is back to the paralytic, 
The man was forgiven, even though it was not stated that he repented. Could it be that the Lord's mercies just saved him, or he could have regretted his sin in his heart and the Lord saw his heart? That's a very good question. Um, and as we could see through the scriptures, the Lord Jesus being almighty God and powerful and being invested in so much power, uh, we could see that at some point, at many times, he would just cast out demons through the power of his word uh, without uh, any negotiations or anything like that. He would just drive them out and heal the. So he, he exercised wonderful mercies to be able to heal people the way he did so, so that so much so that the, the man did not uh, require to have repented for his uh, sins that being said the Lord Jesus's message was a message of repentance so he would go out and uh, spread the good news of repentance and sharing that the kingdom of heaven was at hand and because of the kingdom of heaven was at hand he was calling the people to repent so when people got close to him they could uh, they could they could come to this uh, conviction that they were sinners and that they were in the presence of god and that uh, the sin that they were so accustomed to they will no longer have this willingness to go to it the, the word doesn't tell us exactly that or doesn't tell us what was going on in the people's heart when they encountered jesus in person but we could see that uh, his impact on them was so magnificently powerful and positive that uh, he will cast out demons uh, remove illnesses sicknesses uh, restore them anyone who was crippled or lame and so on so Jesus was doing all those through the power that exerted from him. Um, so, so that is the answer that I have. I don't know if any other elder would like to add anything to, uh, to this answer. No, I, I thought that was good <laughs> because um, we, I think it was Denise that talked about God's, Lord's compassion. And he sees each one of our hearts. Um, so I, us as flesh, <laughs> we don't know how God seen that person. So I, I'm in agreement with you, Henry. It's, it's, you know, it's back to that personal relationship. I can look at someone one way and be like, hmm, but God can, God can look within them and see that there is good, you know, um, that's why we're not to judge the, the outside appearance of a person. Um, you know, because God doesn't judge us that way. So it's, I agree. It's like their relationship with God is how he moves for each one of us. You know, sometimes he moves miraculous with one person and the other person, he might be nudging them. You know, you might be saying, wow, it seems like they're going through. <laughs> um, but it's like the Lord is nudging them. Okay, come on, I'm with you. Let's Let's get this going. So yeah, it's how God sees them. Yes. Thanks. Indeed, it is how God sees them, and that is what matters. That's what matters really. How God sees us, how God sees the heart, the uh, the repenting heart, the heart that is like, oh Lord, whatever whatever it was that I did that was wrong that led me into this predicament, I don't want to do that anymore. Just let me know what it is, and and they might not even be able to open their mouth and and express themselves. But the Lord sees the heart. And he knows the thought, the thoughts that we have. We remember in the case of Hannah, uh, the mother of Samuel, she could barely express the words uh, of, of what was so heavy in her heart. But the Lord saw that. He could see the uh, the murmuring, the, the whispering, the the heavy heart that was that was just pleading their case before the Lord, and the Lord intervened. So, uh, so I agree, uh, Cynthia. The Lord is the one who knows the hearts and uh, and uh, what happened in those situations. So, thank you for your uh, addition. So, Jason, do we have any additional uh, question? We do. In verse 30, why did Jesus ask them to keep quiet after healing them? Yes, that uh, question uh, comes up from time to time. Why does Jesus ask them to be quiet? 
Uh, yes, and uh, there are a few ways to approach this. One way is essentially that the Lord being meek and lowly in heart and, uh, and he doesn't want uh, too much attention on himself. He has a way, uh, a plan to move forward and uh, did he not necessarily want people to come and uh, start uh, uh, being loud and all that so that it will, uh, it will just impede on his plan. Because his plan is to uh, to go throughout the uh, the place and, uh, and and spread the good news of the kingdom of God that being at hand and the message of uh, the message that he he was to bring forward and we've seen that uh, in a passage of the word that Jesus told somebody not to go and publicize this. But then the person did that, and he, he prevented Jesus from moving forward with the next part of his plan, which was to uh, uh, to just go calmly about about the, the preaching, because then now it, it was big crowds that was surrounding him and uh, and just uh, uh, in, impeding his uh, his uh, his free walk kind of thing. So he he he. I, my answer is that I mean what, what I was receiving is that because he's gentle, lowly in heart, he doesn't want uh, uh, people to uh, to just come to him because of uh, they they want healing, but he wanted really that message to be shared, the message for which he's there. He was there on earth to to uh, talk about the kingdom of God that be that is at hand, and uh, and and share that message. So that it's not only all about the miracles, but about the change of heart. Because we remember that John the Baptist had to do a work, a preparatory work that the Lord Jesus was to uh, to, to, to 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 carry on after, and that that work was to prepare the heart of the people, and then when the Lord Jesus come as a Lamb of God, then he start preaching and he start doing the work that the Lord has uh, has uh, appointed him to do. So it's been a long uh, meeting today. So uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you for being here. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, that you love us. And we know so on the basis of your word. You love us. You love us with an, an unfailing love. You died for us and you came back to life so that we can have life everlasting. We thank you, Lord Jesus. You love us, and we love you. We thank you for showing us your ways and teaching us to walk on the path of righteousness, step by step, led by you. As we read your word today, we pray that you would help us gain even more understanding practical ways of applying your word help help us have a faith that is deeply rooted in you as we focus on you and who you are and what you have done holy father i pray that you sanctify us with your word make us holy unto you through the power of your word because it is your will for us to be sanctified. And your word is the truth that brings sanctification. Blessed are you, O oh, our Lord and our God. At the end of this meeting, we ask that uh, your name be glorified and any ties, soul ties that might have formed between us be removed because we desire to be holy unto you. Lord, I pray that you bless your people and that you keep them, that you make your face shine upon them and that you be gracious to them. I pray that you lift up your countenance upon your people and that you give them your shalom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Shalom.